it's safe to say that nobody here in the room can actually get their head around the idea of what this country would be like, what our community would be like, if we didn't tolerate poverty. We have normalized poverty for so long that it just feels normal. And the response I get from communities all over the country is, well, the poor will always be with us. What can we do? Well, let me give you some ideas. Because I believe that we are in a position in this country now. We know what to do. We know how to do it. It's really just a matter of doing it. A lot of people say, hey, Scott, you're from the burbs. Why do you care about poverty? You're a white guy. It's true. I've had every benefit just laid out to me by being white, being a male, and being from the suburbs. I got two parents who were professionals, went to college. I was literally born on third base of life. And yeah, at times it feels like I hit a triple, but the truth is, born right on third base. Huge advantages. It's the problem with a lot of our policy thinking, right? We think, oh boy, I got the third base by hitting a triple. But the truth is, the biggest determinant about your situation with money is where you were, the family you were born into. That's the biggest determinant. So I was raised in the suburbs of Rochester, New York. I went to become an architect. I didn't like that. I went into business, and I went straight into a career of social work, like most people do. <laughs> and how that happened was a friend of mine, during my disillusionment phase of architecture, said, hey, why don't you get your mind off of your mind and go volunteer down at the homeless shelter? And I had to call him, uh, what's a homeless shelter? I didn't even know. I'm raised in the suburbs. I have nothing, no experience of poverty. I went down a few miles from my home, and there were people in destitution, not able to put it together for a meal in the day. This was such a wake-up call for me. I thought, why is this happening? I mean, from the birds, my mentality is there's always enough money to do what you need to do. Well, this career of mine has been uh, lonely in a way because it's been viewed as a humanitarian effort. Deal with poverty, let the nonprofits handle it. There's not any particular economic reason to do this, but it's good to be doing it. I remember once uh, hearing that I was being described as, well, he's still in social work, but he loves it. And the truth of it is, it wasn't very cool to be in this field dealing with poverty. But now something's happened. 78 million baby boomers want to get out of the workforce for the next 20 years. This is going to get interesting. Let me show you. This group, Economic uh, Policy Center, thinks that there's going to be 24% vacancy rates in new jobs for the next many, many years because of this phenomenon. The year that I was born, isn't that a fabulous photograph? The year I was born, uh, 1957, was the biggest year of making babies in the baby boomer era. And since then, uh, the baby boomers have now become the first generation to not replace themselves. 1.7 kids. So, this has created an interesting uh, dynamic. So you can see that the birth rate dropped pretty dramatically. And what that means for communities is this. On the left-hand side, it's a normal community with half the people who are too old or too young to work. And the other half making the money to keep all this going. And a small, unqualified workforce that for some reason can't participate fully in the workforce. This was actually the way most of our communities have been for the last 50 years. It's completely sustainable. It's got us to where we are today. However, as the baby boomers become too old to work or don't want to work and enter into this dependency portion of the pie, it's getting bigger. The workforce is getting more complicated. The qualifications to really do well with it are going up and up and up. So for the first time ever, the business community, the economic folks, have to be in a partnership with folks like me to help go into the unqualified workforce and get things to happen. We cannot rely on the baby boomers to keep all of this moving at the level that we've been for the last 50 years. Let's take a look at the community right here. We're in one of the wealthiest per capita counties in the country right now. And yet, we're allowing almost 3,000 kids to be raised in extreme poverty. This is $10,000 or less for a family of three. So think for a moment what that's like living in that condition. We have another almost 5,000 children being raised in 50% to 100% of the poverty guidelines, which means in total almost 8,000 kids are being raised by what the federal government thinks is poverty. And that is a very low number, by the way, less than $20,000 for a family of three. Another group, bad enough, they're in that 100 to 200% range. And that's all together, 17,000 kids being raised in homes with a lot of anxiety about can we pay the rent? Can we pay the utilities? Can we get the car fixed? 
all of those questions all day long, all of their lives. It turns out that there are studies that say that across the country, when we allow kids to get raised in poverty, the total tab on societal fallout is in the $500 billion range. So if you take the percent of kids in poverty here, divide it into that larger number, we can estimate that we're spending about $333 million a year in this county on the fallout of raising children in poverty. So let's get on with the idea of ending poverty. It doesn't need to be this way anymore. We can make these changes. We're doing this all over the country. We're getting the ball rolling. We'd love to see more activity uh, in this part of the world. And there are some steps we can take. First of all, we have to build a community. People need to feel safe. They need to feel like I can come to a place every week and talk about what it's going to take to make it out of poverty. What are my next step, my next step, my next step? Here we have a picture of people who are uh, in Oklahoma who meet every week people with low income, middle income, upper income, all talking with each other, trying to figure out the problems of life that would advance people out of poverty. The second thing is people need plans. If you don't have a plan, where are you heading? And we've got to talk about money. Can you imagine that we don't teach people about money in this country? It's like, hey, we're going to live in the ocean, but there's no swimming lessons available. <laughs> Seriously, we have to talk about money. We need to get kids really prepared for living in a world that's got a lot of things going on about money. So here people are talking about, for the first time in their lives, most of them, how much do I need to make every month to be okay? How do I get there? We have to match people up with uh, small little circles. So here's Lene. She was making minimum wage, um, and we were able to get her into a full-time job. Got her a better car, better house, safer neighborhood, kids doing much better. She's making 14 an hour now, full time. That was all with the help of her two, what we call allies, Lene and Virginia and Paula, as a circle. We give everyone a lot of appreciation. If you create a cultural appreciation, major things can happen. How many people feel like got enough appreciation this week? That's right, we all have ADD, we all have appreciation deficit disorder. And you have to load it up on people. We have to sustain this community. It's got to be fun. Here we are in Albuquerque. All of our folks are getting free tickets from the utility company for a baseball game. And it keeps it fun. It keeps it interesting. We have to focus on both generations. This kid is going to be our meal ticket when we're in Social Security land. This kid has to do well. Besides the fact that she's cute, she needs to do well. We have to take the big view. So everything that's in the way of getting people from 5000 a year up to 40,000 a year of income, we have got to get rid of the problems that they will run into that are policy-based. So here's Lene talking to the press about that very thing. So I really want to invite you to give your brain a break. The best way to do that is exercising and helping other people. So I suggest everybody run to the nearest opportunity to help a family out of poverty. 